is Australia. This fucking language. Let there be a thousand blossoms bloom as far as I'm concerned. But I ain't spending any time on it. Give him a belly. Don't stop wearing the Speedos. You're listening to Decode, the Tudor Advocates' new podcast series for those Australians who have tuned out or never tuned in to the dark arts of federal politics. It's called being, you wouldn't believe it, a goddamn bloody adult. And for our fourth interview profile of the Batuta Advocates' new Decode series, we're talking to a federal candidate who is hoping to free her constituents from the tyrannical grip of the two-party system. Now, if you're not familiar with the Batuta Advocates' Decode series, our humble newspaper has launched this podcast in a hope to explain the wishy-washy bullshit of federal politics to Australian audiences who have well and truly tuned out or never really tuned in. Your host today are myself, Clancy Overall, editor of the Batuta Advocate. And Errol Parker, the editor-at-large. Now, today's guest comes from a high-profile political family, both her father and grandfather being members of the Australian House of Representatives as Liberals. Is that correct? That's right. Mm. And both later being posted as ambassadors. And today's guest is the former head girl of uh, the elite eastern suburbs girls' school known as Ascom, graduating with one of the best and highest ATARs in the state before launching a career in business. That was before she decided that she could no longer bear being represented in Canberra by a political party led by Scott Morrison. Thank you for joining us today, Allegra Spender, the independent federal candidate for Wentworth. Thanks so much for having me. Now, I hope I got all that right in the research I did. Uh, Look, I've never been introduced as the head girl before, so, you know, that's a nice change. Well, (laughs) yeah, I thought I wanted to to kind of introduce you in a way that would kind of point to your upbringing and how your upbringing may have in any other universe led you to the Liberal Party. (laughs) Indeed. Can you explain to us the moment you snapped? I think... Probably the moment I really snapped was um, during the COP26 lead up. And I felt that, like a lot of people, have been really concerned about climate change and see it also as an an opportunity for Australia because we're one of the sunniest, windiest places on earth. So surely this should be good for us to to decarbonise and lead the world. And we got to COP26 and we saw those final stumblings of the Liberal National Coalition. And when they came out with a non-plan and a non-revision of the Tony Abbott target, that really is when I snapped. And I said, I cannot support this anymore. So as Clancy touched on just briefly before, you come from a quite an esteemed political family. Mm. What made you uh, go your own way when it comes to politics rather than go the old-fashioned way, join whichever party suits your proclivities and then head up to pre-selection win and then become a idle backbencher like they have in Wentworth <laughs> now? Look, we've always been independent thinkers in my family and not necessarily um, towed the line even when my father and my grandfather were part of of politics. But for me, this is about what's important. And I also talk to my dad constantly about this. The Liberal Party is really different to the Liberal Party that he joined and that my grandfather joined. They have quite different values. and And some of that, I think, is where we need to come back to in terms of some of the values that the Liberal Party used to espouse. And you look at what Fraser did in terms of how he welcomed refugees in the 70s. You look at, you know, I was reading something about Menzies, who was talking about, you know, the the importance of a independent public service. And you say, well, these are really different qualities and different values to the ones that we're seeing right now. Now, as we have pointed out, the people of Wentworth and the Spender family have been traditionally blue ribbon liberals, especially, uh, you know, when your local member was Prime Minister Turnbull. Mm. And that all changed when he got rolled by Morrison. The entire eastern suburbs decided to replace him with the independent Karen Phelps. This is probably one you haven't been asked before. Can you explain why Karen Phelps did not get elected a second time at the federal election five months later? Mm. Look, I don't, you, you can't say exactly for sure. I mean, it's a, and it's interesting to see that actually her primary vote increased over that period of time. But it could be, a, I mean, a bunch of different things could have been that, there. I think there was a big scare campaign around Labor. And so I think there was a big concern that a vote for Karen was, was a vote for Labor. I think there was a concern, particularly around the economy. And I think perhaps a complacency that she's in there and, and perhaps you don't need as much advocacy. So I think certainly it was, I think, surprising to Wentworth, and I, and I think there are a lot of people in Wentworth that I've spoken to who've regretted that choice. And, you know, who do you think that you've spoken to that Dave Sharma has lost the support of since he was a first elected? Who who are the voters that have now decided to surrender to the spender? <laughs> 
Uh, look, I think there are lots of different. Uh, that's a great line, by the way. Surrender to the spender. I'm going to use that myself. Um, the, so I had, there are a lot of disaffected liberals I've spoken to. And, you know, these are people who, you know, pre- Traditionally, they are professionals, they are business owners, they are people you know, in the, in the finance industry, in broad industries, who are incredibly frustrated with the current state of affairs. And these are people who are saying, look, you need to listen to the scientists on climate change. You need to listen to the Business Council of Australia about where the opportunities are for this country. Why have we stopped listening? At the same time, you know, I was down on Bondi Beach, you know, pestering, as um, some people call it, mm-hmm. and um, talking to two different people in the communities. And this guy um, walked up and he had his you know, kid on a stroller in front of him. And I was asking him, well, look, what's important to you? And he said, look, for me, climate's really important. He said, I want to live in a humane society. I want to I be kind. I actually want to have a kind place. And he said, but I'm a small business owner, and that's absolutely really crucial to me too. And I think the people that are leaving are the people who say, you know, you can be those three things. You can be someone who cares about the environment and sees this as an opportunity. You can be someone who believes that we should treat people humanely, and then particularly refugees, for example, as being a really stark issue where you know people in indefinite detention who are refugees themselves after nine years of being locked up in Australia. And it's okay to have those two things and to want an environment that's good for business and good for small business. So those are the people that I think, you know, are also feeling very disaffected. Kindness seems to be a big part of what you're talking about here and what the voters are talking to you about. But if we do look down at that hotel down there in, in Melbourne, and it's not a hotel by any means. It's a detention centre where the refugees have been locked up for 15 years. It, it kind of came to light during the whole Djokovic thing. If we look at the people in there and we look at, you know, that young family from Billa Wheeler, if for whatever reason Alex Hawke, you know, wakes up tomorrow with some kind of sense of humanity and decides he wants to release these people, I mean, that's all well and good, but you know and we know for a fact that they wouldn't be able to afford to live anywhere in your electorate. That's another element of humanity, housing. What would you say? What What is the answer to that? And is this even an issue for your voters? Look, it is absolutely an issue for Wentworth. And again, I think see Wentworth in two ways. One is that Wentworth cares about its families and its local community. And the other side is that Wentworth really cares about the broader community. And, you know, there are a lot of parents and grandparents in Wentworth who've talked to me about the fact that their kids will never be able to live in Wentworth, never be able to buy, you know, spoke to one of the surf life-saving heads of one of the local clubs who was saying, you know, he used to be part of a fishing club in Wentworth and all those people have left because they effectively, they cannot afford to live there. And at the same time, I think Wentworth is really interested in a broader perspective on, you know, the national picture. And, you know, when you look at some of the national questions, so for instance, young people's real wages are going backwards. And at the same time, housing is going you know, through the roof. And so that disconnect is a real thing that they are also concerned about because I do think the people of Wentworth, you know, don't just care about themselves. They care about that broader community. So considering that Scott Morrison is about as popular in Wentworth as inheritance tax, how much of uh, your campaigning is based upon, you know, essentially going after Scott Morrison and his policies as opposed to going against his candidate down there? I think it's as much about being frustrated with the system, but it's also about saying, can we paint a different, a more positive picture? So I'm trying not to run a negative campaign. I'm actually trying to say, look, a lot of people are asking me, saying, what's a vision for the future that's more positive? What is a vision for the future that Australians can get behind? So I think it is about climate, but it is about the economy and it is about kindness. So Scott Morrison is absolutely part of that. And, you know, Dave Sharma is also part of that in terms of what is holding Australia back, but also the Labor Party is also part of that. So this is a systems piece as well as, you know, individual frustrations about what's been going on the last three years. Yeah. So Dave Sharma, I've done my research here, and it's a very, very difficult thing to figure out. But I figured out that he has voted with Scott Morrison 96% mm-hmm. of the time since he has been elected mm-hmm. into Parliament. What do you think Dave Sharma stands for? Deep in his core, what do you think, one, drew him to the Liberal Party and to this day warrants so much support of the leadership? To be honest, I think you'd have to ask Dave Sharma mm-hmm. that question. I hope you get a chance to bring mm-hmm. one to your podcast. I think, you know, from what I can see, he talks a, a moderate, you know, voice. But I think what people in Wentworth are really questioning is like, how do you vote? And I think that question of, you know, he's vi- voted with, you know, Barnaby Joyce and Morrison 96% of the time. He's done it on crucial questions for Wentworth. 
questions around things like climate change, question around things like integrity. And so I think that is where the frustration is in terms of, you know, I hear a lot of, you know, kind of nice things about he's a nice guy, but the real question is, can he be and has he been effective in driving the agenda for Wentworth? And that's the piece that, that I think people are really feeling wanting. We've spoken a lot about how the people of Wentworth really care about people who don't live in Wentworth. Mm. How will an independent candidate do more for the people of Wentworth than, say, someone in a major party? Well, look, I think, you know, I think we've just had the last three years to say, well, what has the member, you know, for Wentworth actually done for Wentworth and what has achieved in terms of those values? And I think we're really found lacking. And and again, I come back to climate because that's a real issue. I come back to integrity because that was actually a commitment of the coalition, which they have not and will not fulfil for this for electorate. But I also come back to questions about women. Um, and that's certainly a big group who are very vocal in their support because they are incredibly frustrated. And it's, you know, the local member is not having an impact on some of those really crucial issues. You know, you can then come to the question of the pandemic and, you know, the concerns that people are raising about aged care. People concerns are raising about NDIS. People of Wentworth have their man in in Canberra. Surely we should be getting the results that, you know, people of Wentworth are looking for. But that's not what they're getting and that's not what they're telling me. So do you feel like Wentworth has been taken for granted in, you know, they, they kind of look down at Dave Sharma. Oh, yeah, he's got that. He's got that one lockdown. He took it back off Phelps. Mm. Those people don't vote Labor. Is that what the feeling is on the street? Yeah, absolutely. I think absolutely people feel taken for granted. And a lot of people said, you know, I really appreciate you giving us a choice because we didn't feel like we've had many choices. And I think this is you've given us a real choice in this election. So by first voting in the independent Karen Phelps in the 2018 by-election after Turnbull was disposed of, the voters of Sydney's Eastern Suburbs have proven before that they are not the biggest fans of the modern Liberal Party. Mm. Can you explain to us humble Queenslanders why they don't just vote in Labor? I mean, Anthony mm. Albanese is looking a lot like Malcolm Turnbull nowadays. We saw that Women's Weekly shoot he did with the, you know, with the yeah. the white shoes, the white shirt, and the, and so the thick you know, frame glasses. But like, that's where the boss lives. Yeah, know. yeah. It's, they're, it, they're not <laughs> earning a wage. In yeah. Earth, mate. Well, yeah, that's it. Why why do they hate Labor so much that they would elect an independent as an alternative? Look, I don't know that people hate Labor in Wentworth, but I think that there are some values where they feel that they're not aligned. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think there's frustration with both parties. So it's not just a frustration, I think, with the Libs of the Coalition. I think what there is a frustration for is that politics looks like, you know, theatre sports as opposed to, you know, solid and real debate about what is most important for the country. And they seem to be playing gotcha as opposed to saying, well, these are really the important issues. Where do we see common ground and where do we see real difference? And I think that's a lot of the frustration. It's not just about, you know, the Liberals or Labor. It's actually just about is there's a lot of frustration about the system. And, you know, because we've had Labor in before, and if you look at questions of integrity, you know, Labor could have reformed donation laws. Labor could have reformed, you know, how appointments of um, on public boards are made. You know, Labor could have reformed all sorts of things, which they didn't. And so I think there is a real frustration on that side as much as sort of, you know, we've always been a Liberal seat and, and that's how we are. You talk about the two major parties, but tell yeah. me, what do the people of uh, of Wentworth think of Barnaby Joyce? Uh, I, I don't know that he's incredibly popular in yeah. Wentworth. Not a, no, and, and I mean, sincerely, I don't think he is. And I think that's absolutely, I think that's a lot of the frustration. They feel like there's a wrecker in there and he's pulling the strings in, in relation to climate change. And that drives people crazy. You, you said before you're running a positive campaign. Mm, sure. Do you reckon if you just put core flute posters up of his head around, you know, Bondi of all clues and said, this is what you're getting. Do you reckon that would actually give you a bit of a shot in the arm? Uh, I think I'll, um, I'm not sure that that's going to be the way I'm going to run it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, just on that, if, um, say, for example, the Liberal Party split internally, kind of like what we have um, the National Party, if they Mm. split again into, um, you know, say your traditional kind of Liberals that, you know, are from the older more economically liberal, the true basis of, of what liberalism is, do you think they'd still be able to form a coalition with the, uh, for lack of a better word, the Hillsong kind of um, Liberal Party we have going on now? Look, I, I think you'd have to ask the Liberal Party that. I mean, there are some very strange coalitions in the world and, and people do make things work, but I don't know. You'd have to have to ask them. We're talking about integrity and, and you know, the possibility and, and very much a policy you're running on is the establishment of a federal ICAC. Yep. And we won't go into what the New South Wales ICAC has found over mm. the last year. 
But that aside, do you think Scott Morrison's treatment of Gladys Berejiklian will be playing a role in, in the descent towards you? I think that people expect the Prime Minister to uphold the institutions of the country and really support that. And I, and I think even the example last week around ASIO was another example where I think people expect the Prime Minister to hold himself to a very high standard in terms of where he makes comments that might be political, but, you know, as, a, as really the leader, there are a lot of concerns with that. And I think, you know, people don't want to see ICAC politicised and I don't think they want to see, you know, ASIO and real sort of foreign interference politicised either. There seems to be a bit of momentum behind your campaign, you know. It, it's starting to feel a bit like the Zali and, and, you know, the 2018 Phelps kind of push. Sharma doesn't have the profile he said he would have. He doesn't have a portfolio, I don't believe. Mm. He doesn't, you know, the people of Wentworth would prefer a crossbencher to a backbencher. Mm. I mean, that they've, they've shown us that I before. I certainly hope so, yeah. yeah. they've shown us that before. Scott Morrison doesn't take kindly to people who make life hard for him. Mm. Have you seen any dirty tactics from the Liberals ever since you put your hand up, or have you seen them do anything similar to other independents? Look, I think there's been some a bit of argy bargy. I'm sure it will get a little bit worse over the campaign. And you know, I know I've you know spoken to Karen and others about you know what to expect. But to be honest, I think you just need to push through that and try and focus on what your message is. And that's really what we're trying to do. And I think what we're trying to build on is is really the community and volunteers. So if you you know you can have all the sort of mean sort of social media in the world, but if you've actually got hundreds of people in the community out there wearing t-shirts and talking about why they're supporting a candidate, I think that's a huge antidote to stuff that really looks like it's been, you know, manufactured to try and take someone down. If you go back through and look at um, how a lot of these people in politics have ended up in politics and then we see all the, you know, incredible things you've done with your professional life, do you feel that you're overqualified to run in federal politics? (laughs) I mean, like, one of the biggest things that really got Malcolm unstuck was is that he wasn't able to treat his cabinet like he would you know the sales for at Goldman Sachs Mm -hmm. I mean like if if someone's useless at their job at an investment bank you put your stuff in a box and then you cross the road to to Bell Potter something you you know on the bottom Mm. domestic tier but just in saying that would you be able to to really work with these people? Uh, absolutely. And and I think there really are good people in politics. I, I know that sounds naive. At the same time, I think it's become incredibly narrow. You know, you have so many people who have come up through student politics in staffers. They have really only known that. And I think there's so much to bring across the community that should be into politics. You know, I've worked most recently, I spent the last four years running a not-for-profit, which was low socioeconomic schools around Australia and business. And I love that experience of spending a lot of time with school principals and business leaders and kids and mentors. And I think those are some of the experiences that are worth bringing into politics. But ditto those people who have been doctors and bring that experience. Ditto people who've been, you know, social workers or you know, business leaders or, you know, worked in super funds, whatever it is, I think actually the diversity of experience, if we can bring more of that diversity into politics, I actually think it's going to be better for government. I've, you know, I've run a business where I've been subject to all the different government regulations and trying to make make those work. I've run an organisation through COVID and had to deal with, you know, the difference of responsibilities and, and the changing world. And I think that's experience and that variety of experience is actually really good. So you think that there's better talent out there than career politicians who basically only go to meetings if it involves singing uh, and praying to Jesus? I reckon there is great talent out there and I think it's also a diversity question. You know, I think it's a diversity of experience but it's also a diversity of outlook and so, you know, Australia's... You know, one of the most multicultural countries in the world. We have a huge, you know, 30, over 30% of people born overseas. That's not represented in our parliament. You know, women, LGBTQ people, um, just all sorts of, you know, different ethnic minorities and different perspectives. Like that diversity is what makes the country great. And I think we need to make sure we bring that into the, actually the parliament. It's an interesting point, diversity, because what a lot of people wouldn't know from the outside looking into somewhere like Wentworth mm. or Bondi Beach even, is it kind of, you know, there's a lot of uh, people write it off as the Bondi hipsters or the, or the you know, traditional kind of linen wearing, two and a half kids, 
Range Rover. Mm -hmm. But there is a, a fair bit of diversity there is. in there and there's been different waves of migration there. Mm. Can you explain a little bit about the demographics of your electorate and what their different needs are? Yeah, sure. You know, everyone thinks of Wentworth, I think, as either Bondi Beach and or, you know, sort of Harborside Mansion. Mm -hmm. Sixty percent of Wentworth live in strata apartments, which is much higher than the national average, which is around forty. So it's actually got quite a diverse community, even in terms of socioeconomics. It's a wealthy per capita in an income point of view, but it's also high cost. I mean so very high rental costs and things. You see in terms of the actual demographics, it's got a few bulges, so it's got quite a lot of young people, but you've got it's got quite a lot of in the 20 to 40 people, and then there's a bit of an exodus, and then you has, it has some higher older people. So there are young families, there are a lot of people who come to Wentworth and live there just for, say, three or four years, or a lot of migrant populations, and then you have a lot of um, families who actually sometimes leave Wentworth because of housing affordability, you have people who've been there for generations, and you know, we have a strong older population. So there are all those different communities. But I think that's what makes Wentworth a really exciting place. It is very ethnically diverse. It's very diverse in the sense that people come and go from the community and the communities are quite rich and, and complex. Again, I've just come from Wayside Chapel in Bondi. And again, what we were talking, you know, with, with um, John Owen there, who's the new leader there, is just saying, you know, how do you bring the different parts of the community together and how somewhere like Wayside, which focuses particularly on, on people who are homeless or facing challenges or people who long term are unemployed and trying to get into work, how do you mesh that in with other parts of the community? And when you do mesh that in, that's when, you know, it's real beauty and real joy comes out. Where are those old Bondi scrappers? Like, where are they now, those, those guys that used to, you know, the, the old Leatherman that would sit at the, the Royal Hotel and, you know, yeah. just the kind of career builders and the, yeah. and, the, and the tradies or even the, you know, even the unemployed old bloke at the bar. Yeah. Where have they ended up? And but do you see them around? You do see them around, but a lot of them have had to leave. So you, yeah. it's a real, you know, you do see some of those people around and, and a lot are still there, but yeah. there are also that have, have moved as well. Now... We talk about diversity. There's a diversity of issues in federal politics too. You know what I mean? I yep. mean, you, we've spoken predominantly about very local issues here. Yeah. There you are pushing for, you know, climate change is not a local issue and okay. neither is... Uh, well, you, you know, I think the people of Wentworth are so terrified of climate change because, you know, they'd be among the first ones to go under the water when yep. the sea levels rise. I mean, yep. you've got the low-lying slums of Double Bay, yep. yeah. Rose Bay, Triple Bay. It's all, you know, mm. they're the first ones that are going to go underwater. Yeah, I mean, Amsterdam has an answer to that, but I don't know if we need to build levees or... A dam giant or... dam across the mouth of the uh, heads there. Yeah, I mean... That, across the mouth of the Parramatta River. That's one option. <laughs> That's one option. But, you know, climate change is, is a kind of widespreading issue. Yeah. Federal ICAC kind of is at least Australia-wide issue. But in Parliament, there are issues that take us across the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just looking at what's happening in the Ukraine now. Yeah. I imagine in your electorate you've got people from both the Ukraine and Russian descent. Yeah. What would be your approach to a global issue like this right now? Because mm -hmm. you can't really be expected to just be a local member. Absolutely. And I think... My general approach on issues is to talk to the community and consult with experts and be constructive. And so on foreign policy issues, you know, I see a great alignment, you know, certainly with how I see things and, and what I see in terms of the government and the opposition, because they are fairly aligned in terms of foreign policy issues. But I think with every issue as an independent, I think the responsibility you have is actually to really come to views on specific issues yourself on the basis of you know that consultation with the community and consultation with experts and that's the approach that I would take. So going back to the issues that we're going to see at the ballot in yeah. every electorate uh, this election, do you think the topic of women's safety and just in general women's rights mm -hmm. are, are going to be playing a big role? I mean we haven't actually seen anything like that women's march in mm -hmm. Canberra for mm -hmm. many many years. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that's kind of reared up underneath Scott Morrison, mm. and you could argue that his um, the way he's handled mm. a lot of this hasn't been that good. Mm. Do you think that's going to be playing out both in your electorate and around the country? Look, I do. I think that there's a lot of frustration for women in terms of what the last three years have shown. You know, I'm a mother of um, young girls and I want my girls to feel safe in any workplace and I want them to look up to Parliament as, you know, the pinnacle of, of a workplace that they should see as like this is a great example for the rest of the country. It shouldn't be something that's living in the 70s. And I think that's what we have seen in the last three years. So very much I hear that constantly from women is they want to see better support for women and, and great safety. And one of the key recommendations coming out of the review of parliamentary culture is you need to change leadership because 
because I think if you change leadership, you can change culture. And that's what we need to see. Well, there you have it. Allegra Spender, she's uh, launching a... um She'll be doing a few Q&As down in Centennial Park. That'll be called Spender in the Grass. <laughs> um, we're working on a few taglines today. Surrender to the Spender is a good one. We could put that on the core flute. Yeah. It's got to do better than Dave Sharma will harm you. And with that, the call out is, has been made. Dave Sharma, you are invited onto this podcast. Please join us. We'd love to hear uh, your take and, uh, mm. and your policies and your push. Uh, we'll just finish this. And with, your stock tips. And your stock tips. We'll, we'd love to hear them too. But we'll just finish with today, um, Allegra. If there was one thing you wanted to run with and you wanted to see happen as fast as possible mm-hmm. in Parliament and uh, you were able to get that across the line, what would you be pushing for? I'm saying at least 50% reduction in emissions by 2030 because I think that would put us on a path for you know, responsible action on climate change and actually economic prosperity. There it is. Thank you for joining us. Allegra Spinner, independent candidate for Wentworth. Thank you very much for having me.